Okay, it looks like someone's here. So, as long as there's at least someone here, might as well get started. Welcome to the Animal Diversity 5 lecture, in which we go over our vertebrates. So, looking at our deuterostome phylogeny here. Uh, whoa, hey. We can see all the major features of the deuterostomes. The first thing we see is this notochord, right? A basal feature of the chordates. Uh, and then we have our common ancestor of the chordates. The head delineates the craniates from the previous chordates, cephalochordates and neurochordates. Uh, Mixini, the hagfish, is our basal craniate. Uh, it has a head, it does not have a vertebral column, and it still has a notochord. The development of the vertebral column, which reduces the notochord to uh, the intervertebral discs, uh, gives us the lamprey. Uh, and then we are going to, then we got into the development of jaws and a mineralized skeleton. The first mineralized skeleton we talked about was, of course, the cartilaginous skeleton. Uh, so the cartilaginous skeleton present in the chondrichthyes. So chondrichthyes were the cartilaginous fish. Uh, so we will continue today with the bony fish uh, and talk about some of the features they have that are uh, primitive uh, ancestors to the lungs. We'll talk about the lobed fin fish uh, and the only extant animal, the only extant species, I think there's about three that uh, are ancestors of modern um, vertebrates, terrestrial vertebrates. And of course, the big thing for terrestrial vertebrates is limbs. And the next major thing will be the amniotic egg. And then we'll, in the next lab, uh, lecture, catch up to mammals. And without further ado, let's continue on to the bony fish, right? So. Bony fish, the prefix when you're talking about bone is osteo, so this is osteichthyes. The osteichthyes have an ossified skeleton. It is mineral, mineralized with calcium phosphate crystals, so we have a sturdier skeleton. We lose some flexibility compared to our cartilaginous fish. But at the same time, uh, we gain some strength to it, a little bit of strength and rigidity. So there's some trade-offs there. Uh, a major development in osteichthyes compared to chondrichthyes is the operculum. If you've ever imitated a fish, you've probably put your hands here and gone, what, what, what? Well, that bony plate just behind the head is called the operculum. So it is a bony plate, and it covers the gills. And the huge advantage of the operculum is that it is under muscular control and can be used to pump uh, water over the gills. So in chondrichthys, you had two situations going on. You either couldn't do anything to move water over the gills and thus had to constantly keep swimming, or you could buccal pump, which is mostly useful when you are sitting still. Uh, Osteichthys has this operculum, which allows them to consistently pump water over their gills, consi consistently giving their gills fresh water, 
and allows them to be significantly more mobile uh, and have a larger variety of motions in water. They can swim backwards, right? If a chondrichthian tried to swim backwards, they'd push water out of their gills. Uh, it wouldn't go well. Uh, another major development in osteichthyes is going to be the swim bladder. So the swim bladder is an interesting structure. Uh, initially, it's thought that it developed from an outpocketing of the pharynx. Pharynx. So that outpocketing of the pharynx allowed a small cavity to form. Now, eventually, in most osteichthyes, we saw that it separated from the pharynx. So it was no longer connected to the pharynx. However, the vascular supply, the blood vessels connected up to that structure called the swim bladder, allowed the fish to take dissolved gases from the water and push them into the swim bladder, which would allow it to inflate, right? The swim bladder could inflate with air, and when it did that, it would increase the buoyancy of the fish, allow it to, for lack of a better word, float upwards, well, float, uh, and it could also take that dissolved gases in the swim bladder and dissolve them back into the blood and, in effect, deflate the swim bladder, which produced a reduction in buoyancy and could even give them negative buoyancy. And the big thing here about the swim bladder is that you can reach neutral buoyancy. Neutral buoyancy is a huge bonus because it allows you to move any direction in the water column without worrying about floating or sinking. It gives you a significant boost in mobility options in the water when you can be neutrally buoyant. Swim down a little, well, you stay there. Swim up a little, you stay there. Right? So you have these advantages. Uh, some fish still have the swim bladder connected to the pharynx. Uh, for instance, the lungfish have a swim bladder connected to the pharynx, and they can do a small amount of gas exchange using their swim bladder, making their swim bladder analogous to lungs, likely an ancestor of the lungs. Uh, we no longer have uh, scales, in, uh, in chondrichthys, our scales had denting in them, and they were extremely similar to the teeth. Now the scales do not have denting, right? So, we don't have tooth-like scales. Our scales are small, uh, derived from bone, and they cover the fish in small interlocking scales and we secrete mucus over our fish so we've got a lot of cool options right uh, so we have our small numerous scales um, and you secrete mucus over the scales and it provides a reduction in drag. So that reduced drag allows them to move through water more easily. Right? Aerodynamics in cars allows them to move through the air more easily. Hydrodynamic fish uh, move through the water more easily. So with the chondrichthians, your tooth-like scales all laid flat and they sort of had a nice little uh, pattern where they would reduce hydrodynamics when water moves along them in one direction or increase hydrodynamics 
uh, reduced drag with water moving along them in one direction. The opposite direction has actually a drastically increased drag. Uh, if you were to rub it, one direction would feel smooth and the other direction would feel like sandpaper. So with our osteichthys, that mucus, right, that gives us reduced drag no matter what direction water is moving over the animal. So a huge advantage. We see a lot of diversity of scales in osteichthys, right? Some are scaly. Well, the vast majority are scaly, but we also have some that are armored where scales have fused in order to create sort of a solid armor around the fish. Uh, we can see this in marine sticklebacks to throw it back to an evolution lecture. And if you have ever kept an aquarium, you can also see this in the armored catfish like the Pocostomus. And then you also have scaleless fish, right? So you can see this in most catfish, right? If you are the sort of person who fishes, if you grab a catfish, you can gut it and put it right onto the gill. You don't have to uh, descale it with a scaling knife. Um, so I keep a couple of catfish in my personal aquarium. I like those things. So anyway, there we go. Uh, if you didn't get all that, oops. You can rewind. Okay, we separate bony fish into two basic uh, clades. One is class Actinopterygii. Um, Actinopterygii is characterized by its fins. So we call these the ray finned fish. Right? The ray-finned fish have these rigid, bony rays coming out of the base of their pectoral fin. Right? So you've got your muscular lump of flesh at the base, and then you've got bony rays, and then you've got that very thin fin tissue between the rays. So we can move these rays a little bit to allow the fins to ripple uh, if necessary. Um, we tend to have numerous uh, bony rays and Actinopterygii is the most common, not just the most common fish, but the most common of all vertebrates. Which makes sense because there's an awful lot of ocean for them to colonize. There's much more ocean than land, considering they get to colonize the depths as well. So you can see those rays on lots of different types of fish. Uh, here's a lionfish. So ray-finned fish have bony rays that have uh, bony projections so these bony structures and then they have fins coming off of them and all the muscular movement is at the base here so these are the actinopterygii the ray finned fish generally when someone thinks of a fish they likely think of a ray finned fish we can contrast actinopterygii with the clade sarcopterygii Sarcopterygii are the lobe-finned fish. Lobe-finned fish are a little bit different, right? Uh, they come in two uh, varieties. We have Actinistia, which is right here. They are the coelacanth. And we have dipnoi right here. And these are lungfish. Both of them belong to Sarcopterygii. 
Sarcoctorygii is a major evolutionary uh, sort of transitional form. I hate to say transitional, but they show evolutionary ancestry to all terrestrial vertebrates. And the reason is because of the bones present in their uh, fins. Coelacanths are the good, uh, the example of having the most, they're the extant species that have most recent common ancestry with terrestrial vertebrates. All terrestrial vertebrates are referred to as tetrapods on account of the four limbs. So when you look at a coelacanth uh, fin, right, you have some of those bony rays, but you also have this fleshy lobe. And this fleshy lobe is the big important one because we can see some bones uh, that are homologous to a shoulder. And then in there, we also have a number of bones homologous to the limb bones of vertebrates. So I'll just sort of fill it in with little bones. And you can see what's homologous to like a humerus or a femur or a radius or an ulna or so they're bones that appear to be homologous to vertebrates uh, not identical of course uh, it requires a lot more bony structure to provide the support needed to lift a body in the face of gravity but it is quite amazing that we do see these bony lobed uh, fins. So that is the huge thing about Sarcopterygii, that they have bones and muscles in their fins uh, that are homologous uh, to a certain degree to terrestrial vertebrates, to tetrapods. So uh, there is exactly one species of coelacanth and then a variety of different lungfish. Lungfish do not show that beautiful lobe with the homologous bones. Their lobe is a little different, still a muscular fin, uh, but theirs has been adapted for sort of helping them drag along land if they need to bail on their current muddy pond and find a new muddy pond. So um, the coelacanth, being uh, much like it was about 70 million years ago is uh, still showing those lobes that are exhibiting ancestry with modern tetrapods. They are deep water fish. You find them in the abyss of the Indian Ocean uh, and they were actually thought to be extinct for about 70 million years. For the longest time, people could only find coelacanths in the fossil record. Then around 1938, some people dove deep enough to find coelacanths. So these are pretty much unchanged since their ancestors uh, came around about, or since their ancestors went extinct 70 million years ago. Holdovers. Uh, so pretty awesome. Uh, let me check to see if anyone's still watching. Uh, I got one person, it appears. So, hello, one person. Now we're going to talk about the move to land. So, what does it take to go from an, a, a marine vertebrate to a terrestrial vertebrate? All right, so the transition to land... Uh, occurred in the late Devonian, somewhere around 408 to 360 million years ago. So we can see the earliest transitional forms, 408 million years ago, and then more truly terrestrial forms, about 360 million years ago, taking nearly 40 or almost 50 million years to develop, right? Humans only uh, arose in six million years. So land is a great environment should you be able to overcome the many formidable challenges to living on land. For instance, 
uh, in the Devonian, the marine world is full of predators. Lots of fish uh, eating other fish. So if you can get on land, you can get away from most of the predators. Uh, the only land animals prior to this were arthropods. And they, you didn't have a lot of extremely large arthropods compared to the size of the top tier predators in the Devonian in the marine ecosystems. Uh, in addition to that, there was already a significant amount of green plants on land. Uh, and that could be a source of food. And at the same time, there were all those arthropods on land, which could be a source of food. So we have options for new unexploited food sources. And then lastly, the oxygen you get from water is dissolved oxygen. It's atmospheric oxygen that managed to dissolve in water, which means compared to the atmosphere, water has relatively little oxygen so land offers significantly more O2. So there are distinct advantages for transitioning to land. Fewer predators, uh, lots of unexploited food sources, more oxygen availability, uh, new habitats for reproduction, um, uh, so, amazing advantages. The problem being, of course, that the marine environment and the land environment are drastically different, and we will need specialized adaptations to be able to do uh, go on land. And what do you know? We can indeed find some of those in the fossil record. So, we have in the fossil record an amazing transitional form an ancestor to amphibians called Tiktaalik. Tiktaalik uh, is a really, really cool fossil. It shows a mix of terrestrial and marine adaptations. Terrestrial and aquatic adaptations. So if we were to look at those, the characteristics it shares with fish, right, with marine organisms, scales. In the fossil record, we find those scale imprints on it. In addition, we can tell by the structure of the, uh, the limbs that they are very similar to lobes. So it probably had fins. So, fins for locomotion in the water. In addition, it possessed gills, right? So, it has a set of gills and operculum. So, this is well adapted to aquatic life. But at the same time, we also see rudimentary lungs in the fossil impressions based on the rib cage and impressions in the rock around it we can determine that it has some rudimentary lungs. Additional characteristics that show this transitional form include the neck. So the neck is not present in marine fish in Osteichthys. You don't generally see a neck. Come here, you, what are you, hold on. Trying to escape. So, necks are not generally present in fish. Uh, they can just move their body in the water. Should they need to look to the side, they can just twist their body. On land, it's not as easy to turn around, right? Uh, so, having a mobile neck that allows you to move your head gives you the ability to survey the environment on land more effectively. We also have thicker, more well-developed ribs to support a thoracic cavity. 
a chest cavity that possesses lungs. So it supports a chest cavity with lungs. The skeleton of their fins is actually shows some bony development that gives them more ability to support themselves on land. So based on the structure, right, they have a minor ability to lift their body off of the ground, which you need if you're going to move around on the ground. And they have a little bit more well-developed digits for providing that support on the ground. So we can see that they have a fin skeleton for supporting a body against gravity. So we have both fins for locomotion in the water and a bone structure for supporting and lifting the body to move in an environment with increased gravity. Another feature of land vertebrates is the flattened skull. If you look at amphibians, the first truly terrestrial vertebrates, we see a flattened skull. So what we call a dorsoventrally flattened skull. If you draw a fish, generally you're going to draw a body kind of like this. Maybe here's a fin, there's a fin. And here's an eye on the side, and here's an eye on the side. Little mouth. Right, okay, so there's my fish. And you can see it is laterally flattened, which provides it a fair amount of hydrodynamic, uh, a, a fair amount of hydrodynamics in the water. Right, easier to move through the water when you're flattened. However, a body like that is unstable on land. Right? If you try and move around on land with this body, your center of gravity is all off. You have a bunch of mass up above. So if you have a dorsoventrally flattened body, with some eyes, here's a mouth, rah, you have a much better center of mass for moving around on land. So that flattened skull is an adaptation for moving on land uh, or being stable on land. And then lastly, uh, an adaptation for being on land would be eyes on the top of the skull. So if you look at something like an amphibian, right, their eyes are on the top of their heads. And right? this is because you need to see the environment around, above, and below you. On land, you have potentially arthropod predators or prey flying around above you. And it is helpful to be able to see those uh, in case you want to eat them. So having eyes on the top of your head allows you to look above you. And then, of course, when you're in water, you can still see around you. So. The eyes transitioning to the top of the skull gives you an advantage for surveying the air above you. So Tiktaalik is amazingly adapted to life on land It's a uh, and life in the water. It's a beautiful transition between fish and tetrapod amphibians. So most tetrapods have lungs, at least in some part of their life, and this fossil has evidence of lungs. Um, it has few developments for resistance to desiccation, which makes sense because amphibians have few adaptations to resist desiccation, which means it's going to be restricted to a lot of the same environments as amphibians. So it is not very well adapted to resist desiccation another piece of evidence that it is transitional between an aquatic form and a terrestrial form. So this organism first appeared in the fossil record around 375 million years ago, uh, which means it's pretty close 
to that point where we see some pretty obligate terrestrial vertebrates. So, very cool. So, we've now finished our fish. Right? So, here we go. There's Dipnoi, our lungfish, Actinistia, our lobe uh, fin coelacanths, Actinopterygii. We're coming along nicely. We're done with this much of the phylogeny. So now it's time to get into the terrestrial vertebrates. The first terrestrial vertebrates on land were the amphibians. Amphibians is uh, derived from Greek, and it means both lives. Uh, describing the fact that amphibians have an obligate aquatic life stage and a life stage that allows them to be terrestrial. Right? So their larva has gills and a tail. Right? Gills, tail... Uh, they're herbivorous, eating algae. Um, they're well adapted to aquatic life, and they can only live in an aquatic environment. You can't pull a tadpole out of the water and expect it to live. Whereas the adult amphibian generally shows some degree of lungs. They have... Uh, body supporting limbs no tail anymore uh, they have eyes on the top of their head the tadpoles have them on the sides right uh, they have a variety of adaptations for being on land so they have both lives. Uh, because their larvae are aquatic and because they have very simple eggs, amphibians require water for reproduction. They cannot reproduce without some water source. Their eggs are not like eggs uh, that you find in, say, a chicken. Uh, they consist of the cellular portion and the yolk. And then a sort of jelly coating. There are no adaptations in this egg to resist desiccation. You pull an amphibian egg out of water, and very quickly it will desiccate and become uh, non-viable. Uh, amphibians tend not to have extremely well-developed lungs. Some of them don't even have functional lungs. Uh, so, to supplement the fact that their lungs are not extremely well developed, amphibians demonstrate a process called cutaneous respiration. What is cutaneous respiration? Well, basically, they have extremely vascularized skin. This extremely vascular skin allows right the blood vessels to be very close to the surface so our blood capillaries are close to the surface and we can actually do gas exchange through the skin So if you take an amphibian and uh, damage its skin, you actually damage its ability to breathe. Um, this is why the chytrid fungus is so dangerous to amphibians. It's a fungal pathogen, uh, and it is a skin infection. So it infects the skin... And as it infects the skin, it digests the skin. And as it does that, it basically suffocates the animal. Because the amphibian breathes through its skin, 
the more skin that gets damaged, the less it is able to breathe. So when the infection progresses far enough, the animal suffocates to death. Let's see, where's my gecko? Come here, you. Think you can just run around? So this is an adaptation in amphibians that is excellent for the fact that their adult life stage is not fully terrestrial. Cutaneous respiration is pretty convenient when your lungs aren't up to the task of providing all the gas exchange you need to keep that highly mobile active lifestyle. So you have cutaneous respiration. There are four extant orders of amphibians. They are or three extant orders, excuse me. They are Anura, Caudata, and the hard to pronounce Gymnophiona. Anura includes what you think of when I say amphibian, the frogs and the toads, right? Um, they're notable because they undergo extensive metamorphosis. If I say amphibian metamorphosis, you're thinking the little tailed tadpole that uh, lives a purely aquatic life and then eventually starts to get little limb buds, uh, gets its little forelimb buds, and its tail reduces. Its eyes transition from the side to the top of the head, and it eventually develops into an adult frog. Never miss an opportunity to draw a frog. So, that is a rather extensive amount of metamorphosis. It undergoes extensive metamorphosis. The larval stage is drastically different from the adult stage. Uh, more differences in the larva show that uh, amphibian or anurin larvae are herbivorous, eating algae and other plant matter, but adult anurins are obligate carnivores, only feeding on living things. Uh, in fact, their carnivory is really quite fascinating. Their eyes are keyed into movement. An amphibian, uh, an anurin, will not hunt something that doesn't move, right? There's only a few exceptions out there. Those little uh, aquatic aquarium frogs you can get, the African dwarf frogs, will gobble up fish food. But the frogs I keep, my leopard frogs, uh, my Pac-Man frog and my yellow-bellied frogs, they will not eat unless the prey is actually moving. They require movement to feed. They basically, uh, it kind of looks like they can't see the prey if it's not moving. Huh, wait a second. In that Jurassic Park movie, they said, stop moving. It can't see you if you don't move. And wait a second. They said that they filled in the gaps of the dinosaur DNA with amphibian DNA. What? It all makes sense now. It's not even stupid. Okay, it's still stupid because why would you fill dinosaur DNA with amphibian DNA? It doesn't make any sense. Ah. Uh, these, uh, the anurins are endangered worldwide, right? They are thoroughly endangered. There's a lot of anurin populations that are in danger of going extinct. This is due to a number of things, right? First off, we have the invasive pathogens like chytrid fungus. Chytrid fungus is native to uh, regions in Asia 
uh, where the amphibians co-evolved with the pathogen. However, that pathogen has been transferred worldwide, and any amphibians that didn't co-evolve with it basically catch it and die. Uh, once they get chytrid, there's almost nothing you can do to save it. Um, there's very few, uh, if any, successful treatments for chytrid infection. Um, so that's a huge problem facing it. When explorers go to areas that are untouched in South America, they can often find chytrid-infected amphibians. It is able to spread more effectively than humans, which is insanity. Uh, in addition to that, amphibians are highly sensitive to pollution. Uh, this is because of their terrestrial and aquatic life and their cutaneous respiration. So their aquatic stage, the larva, uh, are extremely susceptible to water pollution because they have gills. Um, relatively uh, poorly developed bodies, too. Their locomotion is tail only. They have no stabilizing fins. Um, so... Water pollution, even small amounts of water pollution, can negatively impact the larva. And then the adults, cutaneously respirating, can be impacted by small amounts of water pollution and small amounts of air pollution. So, uh, anurins are often used as an indicator species. An indicator species is a species that is highly susceptible to pollution. Uh, think of it like the canary in the coal mine, right? The canary is down in a coal mine to detect if there's uh, pockets of, like, sulfur gas or something that's going to smother out the oxygen. If the canary in the cage in the coal mine dies, that means everybody has to get out fast. Uh, amphibians, the anurins, if they start disappearing from the environment, that means something is wrong in the environment. And they'll be some of the first to disappear. All right, caudata, the salamanders. So salamanders have a more subtle metamorphosis, right? Uh, the larvae are carnivorous, just like the adults. So the larvae and adults are carnivorous, right? In addition, the larvae tend to have uh, limbs much sooner, so they develop limbs. It's not just sort of the end stage of metamorphosis. Uh, the larvae tend to have eyes more closely positioned to the adults, um, and basically you even see the fact that in a lot of salamanders, in most salamanders, uh, the gills don't go away. Rather, they become internal. So we get the development of internal gills. And not even in all caudatins do they become internal. This is the axolotl, pretty common in the pet trade very endangered in the wild. Uh, the axolotls uh, have gills as adults. They don't lose their gill fringes. So because adults retain a lot of the larval structures, the adults retain larval characteristics We term the type of metamorphosis they undergo as pedamorphosis, right? Paid, uh, the prefix for uh, young or child. So they retain a lot of larval characteristics, so they undergo pedamorphosis, rather the extensive metamorphosis seen in anura. And then finally, an amphibian that most people probably don't know about is the Sicilian. Sicilians are really cool amphibians. 
So they tend to be uh, mostly, well, I don't know about that. There are terrestrial Sicilians and there are aquatic Sicilians. We find them restricted to tropical environments. They'll exploit uh, burrows, right, in the soil. Uh, they'll also be in water. And you can also find them in caves. Hooray, my sound is working this time. Uh, so, one of the really cool features of these guys is the secondary loss of limbs. The Sicilian has a resemblance to snakes. They have a secondary loss of limbs and they are motile based on muscular movement. Uh, so, very cool. Sicilians, almost all of them are blind, eyesight being particularly unnecessary in burrows and caves. They have other sensory structures, uh, and they exhibit extensive parental care compared to their other amphibian cousins. Anurin parental care consists of swim away from your tadpoles because if you stick around, you're going to eat them. Uh, Anurins practice sort of convenient cannibalism. Uh, if, it's, uh, if there's enough of a size difference that they can eat them, they will eat them. Uh, I'm not as familiar with salamanders, but it's probably pretty likely that they will also exhibit cannibalism uh, when there's enough of a size difference. Sicilians, however, will lay their eggs, they'll guard their eggs, right? And they will even feed their young. Now, it's not like they're going out and catching food to bring back to their young. Uh, it's kind of slightly like a horror show. Uh, this is Boulin Girl Titanus, why not? Blanjurula Titanus? Let's do that one. You're forced to assume I know what I'm saying. Uh, this is an African Sicilian. And once the eggs hatch uh, for up to four weeks, the larvae eat fat deposits out of the mother's skin. So, that's horrific. Uh, I'm glad humans don't have mildly cannibalistic larvae. But... That is indeed a form of parental care, feeding the young, right? It is, uh, a, has a negative impact on parental survivability because they're losing fat deposits, uh, but the young have a greater boost in survivability. So this is vastly more parental care compared to the other amphibians. Kind of really cool. So... There are actually Sicilians in the pet trade. Uh, you can find them occasionally under the term rubber eels. Uh, if you're thinking about getting a Sicilian, I recommend you read up on their care because standard tropical fish care probably won't work as well for Sicilians. But it's just really cool that I get to tell you people about a type of amphibian that is likely unknown to most of you. All right. Uh, let me take a second and find where my gecko has gone off to now. Next up is the major development for terrestrial living. Amphibians are still restricted to extremely humid or uh, environments at the edge of aquatic uh, places. So their reproduction restricts them to environmental places. Some amphibians have some cool adaptations. Uh, for instance, right here we have a frog that does mouth brooding. Um, so this, uh, this frog will keep the eggs in its mouth uh, in order to keep them in an aqueous environment. Some of them have eggs implanted into the skin on their back 
to maintain humidity. But either way, uh, de larval development uh, and eggs are requ uh, dependent on water. So how do you move deeper into the terrestrial environments away from the water? Well, let me introduce you to the clade amniotes. So, wow. Yeah, there we go. That looks nice. The amniotes. So the amniotes are characterized as having what we call an amniotic egg. The amniotic egg uh, is a feature of reptiles, birds, and mammals. So reptiles, dinosaurs, and mammals are our amniotes. The amniotic egg is a huge adaptation for being able to exploit terrestrial environments. Basically what happens is an amniotic egg is watertight, right? So we no longer have to worry so much about desiccation. That is now less of a problem. The egg outside of water will not immediately desiccate. And then in order to support embryonic development, we have a series of embryonic membranes serving important functions. So we have embryonic membranes. What are those embryonic membranes? Well, pop. We have the Corian, the Amnion, the yolk sac and the allantois. Uh, I don't know if you're a French person, you might say allantois, but that sounds kind of weird to me. So I'm just going to say allantois. Be American about it. Why not? American. Not American. Yeah, whatever. It was a joke. Uh, so the Korean is a membrane that is for gas exchange. Right? While the egg may be watertight, it is not uh, like airtight. So we still have gases crossing the shell. And so we have a membrane that can modulate that gas exchange. Gas exchange uh, crosses the Corian. The amnion is a fluid filled membrane. It creates a little cavity that supports the offspring, so the embryo. So you'll have a little cavity here, and you'll have the little embryo developing in the cavity. Why not? That's a good embryo there. We'll put a little limb bud on it. So this is the amnion. Uh, this fluid here is homologous to the amniotic fluid in a human. So the amnion is a membrane that creates a uh, fluid filled cavity to support the embryo and help it develop even in a gravity uh, oppressive environment. Um, then we have a yolk sac. So the yolk sac is just a nutrient filled sac that will provide the uh, embryo the nutrients required for development. And finally, we have the allantois, which is another membrane that connects up to the embryo. I'm probably putting it on the wrong side, but I ran myself out of drawing space. Uh, the allantois is a cavity that basically uh, stores metabolic waste. Uh, 
because if you are in a watertight egg, uh, you cannot exactly excrete the metabolic waste produced during growth and development. So you have a specialized membrane to store the metabolic waste and keep from poisoning your embryo as it develops in the egg. So these are some pretty cool adaptations to have an egg that can survive on land. I'll give it a couple seconds here for anyone writing as I'm talking. Oh, hello to the four people. Uh-oh, I think I killed that slide. Uh, well, c'est la vie. The good news about videos on the internet is you can drag the cursor back a little. <sighs> okay, maybe give you guys like five seconds in case someone's still riding. Like, pull the cursor back. Give me a chance to drink some coffee and see if my gecko has gone walkabout again. You are determined. You are determined to cause me problems. Come here. Okay. Amniotes being here. So we are going to talk now about reptilia. Uh, in traditional phylogenies, reptilia includes the dinosaurs. Uh, although modern phylogenies separate out dinosaurs from reptiles, indicating that dinosaurs have a very close common ancestor with reptiles, but do not share enough features to actually be considered reptile. So let's get into Reptilia and Dinosauria, the amniotes covered by this lecture. So the big thing about Reptilia is that we now have Fully terrestrial vertebrates. Now, ah, that pin just stopped working. We have fully terrestrial vertebrate, vertebrates. We are not reliant on water for anything except, you know, drinking it. So we can move much further inland. inland. Uh, we are no longer needing to stay by the water, allowing us to exploit even more uh, environments. So, reptilia is the common ancestor for both dinosaurs and mammals. Uh, so, reptiles evolved early. Um, they evolved in the early Triassic, and for about 250 million years, they were the dominant terrestrial vertebrate on the planet, only being displaced when the dinosaurs adaptively radiated. A major feature of the reptiles is the fact that they are ectotherm. An ectotherm is an organism that does not have the ability to modulate its own internal temperature. So an ectotherm is dependent ah, on the environment to modulate its body temperature. Basically, that means an ectotherm will alternate its environment between basically warm, sunny areas or cool or shady areas. So, by alternating between warm and cool environments, they can heat up their body or cool down their body in order to maintain the homeostasis body temperature required. So they cannot maintain their body temperature internally. 
There are some exceptions, but they are few in reptilia. We can contrast this with dinosaurs and mammals being endotherms. So endotherms have internal temperature regulation. Uh, basically, the chemical reactions that power their metabolism uh, keep them warm. And thus, all they need are a few uh, adaptations to cool their body off. Sweating in mammals, uh, feathers in dinosaurs. So, um, continuing through reptiles, there are some very cool uh, reptiles out there to talk about. One is the Tuatara. So, Tuatara is a really neat organism. It has a third eye. What does that mean? The third eye is on the top of its head. It actually has a lens and a retina. Features of an image forming eye, which is pretty amazing. However, uh, it is also covered in a thin layer of scales. So it's likely not uh, forming, any, ugh, forming any images. In reality, it's probably just detecting light. So it's a light yes-no sensor. Um, it can help it modulate its uh, sort of life cycle. Um, maybe help it modulate when it goes into heat and shade. And also, if a bird of prey passes overhead, it might be able to detect the shadow. So, uh, there are two extant species of Tuatara, and they are restricted to New Zealand. Which sucks, because New Zealand is particularly vulnerable to... Wow, that is just... Let's go this way. That's close enough. New Zealand is particularly vulnerable to environmental disturbances. Tuatara is on record of uh, lived over a hundred years. So they've got lifespans similar to tortoises. And speaking of turtles and tortoises, uh, they are some of the oldest species uh, of reptile. So they are some of the earliest reptiles to appear in the fossil record, uh, extremely ancient lineages. Wow, my pen is just freaking out. Yeah, there we go. You know what? I'm going to erase the slide. Okay. So these are an ancient organism, right? Their lineage is ancient. And sea turtles are relatively unchanged. Some of the first in the fossil record are sea turtles. And uh, they are relatively, well, sea turtles appear early. They weren't, of course, the first tortoises, as tortoises were terrestrial. But uh, sea turtles have remained relatively unchanged in the last, you know, 200 million odd years. So that's pretty sweet. Uh, these have champion lifespans. Uh, the Galapagos tortoises um, have been, like, there are likely some Galapagos tortoises alive now that were alive in the 1800s when Darwin first observed them. So, some of these uh, turtles and tortoises have incredibly long lifespans. When I say reptile, you likely think lizard or snake. So lizards and snakes are the most numerous of the reptile species. Uh, there's nearly 4,000 species of lizards described and 3,000 species of snakes. 
Uh, so lizards and snakes are older, or well, not older. Snake. Uh, lizards are older than snakes. Right? The lineage that divide. The, the lineage that diverged to produce the snakes diverged off of the lineages that produced modern lizards. Snakes have a secondary loss of limbs. So, uh, that's pretty cool. It's not like they evolved without limbs. They evolved from a four-limbed ancestor, and it had a reduction of limbs and then a loss of limbs. In fact, if you look around the tail of a snake, you'll often find a pair of little keratinized projections, right? Uh, usually more obvious on males than females, but these are thought to be uh, little elements of those lost limbs. Um, they're not like mobile or jointed or anything. They're kind of like a whale pelvis. Uh, they might serve a function in reproduction, but I don't know it offhand if they do. So lizards and snakes are the reptile most people think about. There are some cool features of reptiles. Uh, one of them is that they do not have a diaphragm. Reptiles actually have a fundamentally different respiration setup than humans. They do have lungs, uh, but they are referred to sometimes as box lungs. So our lungs, inhalation, exhalation is controlled by a muscle in the bottom of our chest cavity called the diaphragm. The diaphragm contracts and pulls the lungs down and the ribs spread a little and uh, there's a pressure change that allows air to rush into our lungs and then when the diaphragm relaxes it pushes the lungs up and the chest uh, relaxes and closes back up a little bit and that creates a pressure change that pushes the air out of our lungs so uh, the diaphragm is a major feature of respiration and Lizards, reptiles, they do not have a diaphragm. No diaphragm in the reptiles. In fact, respiration is controlled by the limbs and the ribs. So they have to move here in order to actually respire. They don't have a muscle at the bottom of their chest cavity to manipulate their lungs. So they manipulate their ribs and forelimbs. Uh, and one of the neat artifacts of that is that when a lizard runs, it cannot breathe. So lizards tend to exhibit sort of a staccato running pattern where they run and stop and run and stop and run and stop. And part of that may in fact be due to the fact that they need to take a second to actually breathe. Some lizards, like my gecko, uh, I don't know if I can get it close enough, have an adaptation uh, for buccal pumping air over their lungs. So they can use the muscles in the bottom of their oral cavity and their throat in order to push air over their lungs. Oh, nice try. Try and get you close enough to see buccal pumping and you are not calm. Ah, whatever, that was close enough. Maybe you saw it, maybe you didn't. Ah, there we go. So, okay, sorry, buddy. So, buccal pumping is an adaptation to be able to breathe more readily, even if you're running. But still, when they run, they have, if any, ability to breathe. Uh, it's extremely reduced. So, that's kind of neat. You can thank your mammal lineage for that diaphragm. In fact, it's one of the major features of mammals. All right, and then the last group of reptiles to go over are the crocodilians. So, crocodilians include crocodiles and alligators. Now, part of that 250 million years of reptile dominance was the crocodilians. 
uh, crocodilians were hugely competitive when they evolved. They have a few really cool features. They show a greater degree of parental care than most other reptiles. Uh, they will dig a nest and they will guard the nest. And indeed, once their eggs hatch, they will, for a certain amount of time, guard their hatchlings. So they have, compared to other reptiles, an extensive amount of parental care. This gives their hatchlings a greater chance at survival. And uh, crocodiles and alligators were the dominant terrestrial predators for quite a while. Uh, there were crocodiles that had evolved uh, the ability to run. They had long running limbs, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, so they have some neat adaptations that their other reptile counterparts do not have. So all other reptiles have a three-chambered heart. What that means is you have your two atria connected to a single ventricle, right? Uh, so blood from the body enters the atria, uh, and it's deoxygenated blood coming in here, and it's transferred to the respiratory system, and then it comes back to the same ventricle before leaving, uh, well, I did the arrows all wrong, but whoosh. So, you have your three-chambered heart, blood comes in from the body, goes to the common ventricle, right? And then the common ventricle pumps some blood to the lungs and some blood to the body, and the blood at the lungs, comes back through the other atrium, back in. Do you need to know the geography of it? No, but it's pretty cool because we have mixing of oxygenated and deoxygenated blood in the ventricle. So they have a three-chambered heart. Basically what that means is it is not nearly as efficient, right? Because you are pumping out to the body blood that is mixed, right? Some of the blood pumped out to the body is deoxygenated, mixed with oxygenated blood. So you're not getting a really efficient distribution of oxygen. Uh, crocodilians and all other amniotes have a four-chambered heart. And the four-chambered heart allows you to... Uh, distribute blood significantly more efficiently, right? So you have blood coming from the body entering one atrium, then enters a ventricle that goes to the lungs. From the lungs, we enter the other atrium. That atrium enters the next ventricle and then it goes out to the body. This is in no way an anatomically correct diagram, more of a flow chart. But you can see that we separate deoxygenated blood from oxygenated blood, so that what we're pumping to the body is always oxygenated blood. This provides crocodilians and the other amniotes a significant boost in metabolic activity. Four-chambered heart providing oxygenated blood to the muscles allows a lot more muscular activity. They, uh, they are more active, or they can be more active than their lizard, tortoise, and tuatara brethren. So, pretty cool uh, that they have that four-chambered heart. Uh, so, I dig that. Crocodiles are more closely related to dinosaurs than the other living reptiles. So if you're charting a phylogeny of dinosaurs showing relatedness, uh, you have to put crocodiles closer to...
to dinosaurs than other reptiles. So here's our crocodilians in this phylogeny. And if we follow it back, we have a branch point here, a node, and then that node leads to dinosaurs. And you have to go further back to get the branch point to the other reptiles, like turtles and, uh, you know, the marine reptiles and modern lizards and snakes and tuataras. So you can see crocodilians are much more closely related to dinosaurs than they are to other reptiles. This makes sense because they have a four-chambered heart. Other reptiles do not. Dinosaurs have four-chambered hearts. So that's a really cool artifact. And the other thing I want to mention here is that when we look at Dinosauria, right, it branches out into what we call bird-hipped dinosaurs and what we call lizard-hipped dinosaurs, uh, where we find um, our avian dinosaurs and our non-avian dinosaurs. But you know what's not a dinosaur? A flying reptile. The pterosaurs, pterodactyl, pteranodon, and stuff like that, rampharynchus, whatever, those are not dinosaurs. No, not dinosaurs. And the marine reptiles, like your mosasaurus and your plesiosaurus and your ichthyosaurus, right? Those are not dinosaurs. Those aren't even closely related to dinosaurs. They're more closely related to snakes than they are to dinosaurs. So if you ever ask someone, hey, what's your favorite dinosaur? And they say pteranodon, maybe you get in their face a little and be like, hey, man, I asked you your favorite dinosaur. Don't screw with me, buddy. And they'll be like, oh, it's the mosasaurus then. And you'll be like, I, I'm done with you. And you unfriend them on Facebook, and that's the end of that relationship. Uh, so, it's important that you tell people what Dinosauria actually includes so you don't have an unfortunate severing of relationships. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about class Dinosauria. Once uh, identified as a reptile, Dinosauria is now considered a separate class. It is not part of Class Reptilia. It is its own class. Uh, closely or more closely related to reptiles than anything else, but its own class. The only extant dinosaurs are birds. Avian dinosaurs are birds. They are the only extant dinosaurs, the only dinosaurs to survive the dinosaur apocalypse. The KT event, where we had that big old meteor impact the planet and screw with the entire climate and probably influence volcanic eruptions and basically just destroy everything. Uh, so, dinosaurs were, for a long time, the dominant uh, terrestrial vertebrate on the planet. They displaced crocodilians relatively quickly. Uh, did a lot of adaptive radiation and very quickly became the dominant life, uh, terrestrial life form on the planet. Uh, the only thing that ended their dominance was an apocalypse. They would have continued their terrestrial dominance. Um, so, theropod dinosaurs are where we put avian dinosaurs. So, birds are theropods. What is a theropod? A theropod is a bipedal dinosaur. Most of the theropods were carnivores. You want an example of a carnivore? A uh, carnivorous theropod? Here's Tyrannosaurus rex. Right? A velociraptor? That's a theropod dinosaur. Deinonychus, Allosaurus, right? All of those theropod dinosaurs. So, um, that is also where you find birds. 
which is pretty cool. Features of theropod dinosaurs, the non-avian theropods and the avian theropods, include hollow cavities in the bones. So we have a lot of hollow cavities, and these allow for a reduction in bone mass. So we have hollow cavities in the bones, and then we also have quite common throughout the theropods, feathers. So feathers are a key adaptation of dinosaurs. So not just avian dinosaurs, mind you. Feathers are seen throughout theropoda. Uh, so lots of different theropods had feathers. Very old lineages of theropods had feathers and dinosaurs that very much could not fly had feathers. There's a dinosaur that's an ancestor of T-Rex called Euteranus, uh, lived up in what would become the Arctic Circle and had extensive feathering over its body, but was also a very large theropod carnivore and in no way could fly. Velociraptors belong to a group called the Dromaeosaurids. Dromaeosaurs are characterized by that wicked sickle claw on the foot. These are the closest common ancestor to modern avian theropod dinosaurs. Uh, and they had extensive feathering. Extensive feathering. Uh, they had feathering all over the body. They had feathers that resembled uh, the modern bird tail feathers along the tips of their tails. Uh, and along their arms, they had feathering that resembled some of those primary feathers birds use in flight but dromaeosaurs most certainly could not fly. So it's likely feathers served similar purposes to hair. So they were analogous to hair, likely provided adaptations for cryptic colors uh, or signaling. So some communication function. Uh, so, feathers developed much earlier than flight, which is pretty cool. Uh, other very cool things about dinosaurs, right? Uh, in Tyrannosaurus uh, fossils, um, they have actually been able to put fossil sections in an acid that dissolved away the mineralized fossil and left behind genuine collagen. You can, in fact, recover collagen, which are uh, sort of smooth, strong protein fibers from some dinosaur fossils. Uh, collagen does not have genetic material in it, sorry. However, being a protein structure and the fact that uh, genes uh, code for protein we can analyze the protein structure of collagen and sort of see what's closely related to dinosaurs. And so the T-Rex was the first one where we found collagen. And when we analyzed the collagen uh, and compared it to extant dinosaurs, the extant dinosaur whose collagen was most closely related to T-Rex was your friendly neighborhood wild chicken. Well, not your neighborhood chicken, uh, but the chicken from which modern chickens were domesticated has collagen fibers most closely related to those found in the T-Rex. The T-Rex, uh, modern fossil uh, analysis and skin imprintations show that the T-Rex uh, is unlikely to have been feathered, which probably represents a secondary loss of feathers in the T-Rex. So that's pretty cool. Um, perhaps they had some small amount of feathering, maybe on their head or something. But 
uh, skin impressions seem to indicate that they did not have feathers over their body, which is pretty cool because a lot of other theropods, skin impressions have indicated that they had feathers all over their body. So uh, just really cool. So now let's talk about the avian dinosaurs, the extant dinosaurs. And the first thing to talk about is their evolution. Where is my gecko? Give me a one second. So in the fossil record, we can find a lot of cool evidence showing intermediate forms in avian evolution, avian dinosaur evolution. Now, these intermediate forms aren't direct ancestors necessarily to modern avian dinosaurs, but they do show how the uh, features of a dinosaur and the features of a bird quite overlap enough to consider avians dinosaurs. So the first fossil to spark the reclassification of birds as dinosaurs was Archaeopteryx. Right? Archaeopteryx is amazing. It's about a 150 million year old fossil. Uh, it was found in the, I think, late 1800s. Uh, <clears throat> and it is an intermediate form. Now, what's interesting is that it is not a direct ancestor, right? You don't have Archaeopteryx and then transition to, like, avian dinos. Uh, if you had to do a phylogeny, uh, you'd end up putting Archaeopteryx much further back. And then you'd have to go through a couple of other lineages to get your avian dinosaurs. So Archaeopteryx isn't even a direct ancestor, indicating that features of birds uh, converged in multiple lineages. More evidence that birds are in fact dinosaurs. So what are our intermediate features? Well, Archaeopteryx had teeth like dinosaurs, right? So they had a mouth full of teeth. Avian dinosaurs do not have teeth. I just like drawing. I just like drawing teeth. Arr. So, avian dinosaurs, no teeth, right? You can actually see some teeth during embryonic development in certain lineages. Uh, embryonic chickens actually show some teeth, uh, but they quickly uh, disappear. It's kind of like the human tail that uh, generates during embryonic development. It's reabsorbed. Uh, they have hollow bones more similar to the large theropods. So their bones are more similar to the larger theropods than they are the avians, meaning that while they're hollow, they are not quite as extensively hollow as modern avian dinosaurs. So their bones are more dense, but still hollow. Uh, and then another big feature is the bony tail, right? A bony tail. Birds have a very reduced, avian dinosaurs have a highly reduced tail. Their tail feathers all attach at a little tail nub, which is why when they move their tail around, the whole thing sort of wiggles. Right? Archaeopteryx had a bony tail running the length of its body, more like its uh, dinosaur ancestors. So... Uh, these are some dinosaur features, and then it has a number of avian dinosaur features. Feathering, much more similar to flying dinosaurs. So we have our uh, contour primary flight feather wings. That's very similar to modern avian dinosaurs. Whether or not it could fly is up for debate, but... Uh, due to imprintations of feathers, we can see that the organization of feathers along its arms 
<coughs> are very similar to the organizations of feathers on modern avian dinosaurs. It had clawed fingers. So grasping clawed fingers, uh, which is, of course, a feature of dinosaurs. Um, and it had a, uh, in addition, going back to features of dinosaurs, a dinosaur-like sternum. Uh, so what does that mean? Basically, compared to avian dinosaurs, the sternum is reduced, uh, sort of flattened. Uh, this is important when you compare the sternum of a modern avian dinosaur. The sternum has this huge extension that uh, is just massive. And the reason they have this massive sternum extension is because the sternum is an attachment point for the massive pectoral muscles needed to generate lift during flight, right? When you move those <clears throat> arms down, those wings down on the downstroke to generate lift, you need massive, massive muscles to do that. And so those huge pectoral muscles attach to that sternum extension. Another cool avian feature is the furcula. Uh, you might know it in avian dinosaurs as the wishbone. What? Very cool. Uh, lots of theropod dinosaurs had the furcula. Here's an allosaurus furcula. Here's a dromaeosaur, the Velociraptor furcula, and here's the Archaeopteryx furcula. So, uh, <clears throat> and then a modern avian furcula has some little jointed surfaces. Looks kind of like that, where we have some jointed surfaces, but still that distinct curve. So, theropod dinosaurs indeed had wishbones. So, Archaeopteryx represents an impressive blend of intermediate features between those uh, avian dinosaurs and non-avian theropod dinosaurs. So, uh, very cool. Uh, and like I said, while not a direct ancestor, it indeed... Uh, uh oh it indeed shows a lot of uh, adaptations. It's excellent evidence for evolution. I heard a warning thing in my computer, so I'm just going to check to make sure everything looks good. Still live. Still got three people watching. Hey, hello, three people. Uh, okay. Everything seems to be in order. Yeah. Still seems to be in order. Then I shall continue. All right, let's talk about the extant dinosaurs. The avian dinosaurs. Oh, that's just pretty writing. Okay. The avian dinosaurs are the most diverse of the vertebrates of the terrestrial vertebrates. Fish are a little more diverse, but they're not terrestrial. So, avian dinosaurs are the most diverse of the terrestrial vertebrates. This is likely due to their ability to colonize multiple beaches, right? Not only uh, do they show an impressive degree of adaptation? Right? You got penguins, non flying aquatic. You have little uh, flightless dinosaurs like the, the kiwi here. You have nocturnal dinosaurs adapted well to preying on small rodents. You have large seed and fruit eating dinosaurs adapted to the tropical jungles. Uh, and because of flight, they can rapidly radiate to new environments. So uh, 
they have the ability to find and colonize plenty of new environments, which is in fact why they are the most diverse of terrestrial vertebrates. There are <clears throat> unique features to the avian dinosaurs, the extant avian dinosaurs, including the feather. The feather uh, is a hollow structure. It has a shaft or a pin, right? Um, during growth, there's a blood vessel that runs up through the pin. Uh, provides vascular uh, tissue so that we have nutrients and such to grow the feather. Once growth is complete, the blood supply uh, stops up. Coming off of it, we have what we call veins. So this is the shaft, sometimes called the pin. Here we have veins coming off. They are paired coming off of each side of the shaft and then coming off of the veins we have now well, that's not a good spot but anyway we have barbs and little barbules so the barbs are little uh, spikes coming off of the veins and then the barbules are kind of little hooks that allow the spikes to sort of join together uh, creates a loose connection between all of the veins to hold these light structures of the feather together um, <clears throat> provide some very cool features so uh, one of those features is lift Right? It catches the air quite well without deforming because enough air can pass through that kind of hollowish structure of a feather that you're not going to worry about bending the feather backwards. But at the same time, the feather stays intact and provides lift. Uh, so it moves the air quite well. In addition, <clears throat> feathers can be used to both cool off and insulate the animal. So uh, you can cool the animal when the feathers are lying flat. Uh, you tend to get a fair amount of air movement over the animal and over the skin. Uh, so it allows you to cool it. And when you uh, I, I like to call it fluff up the feathers, like those pigeons on campus when it's cold. They'll fluff up all their feathers. Uh, that creates air pockets. And those air pockets are warmed by their body temperature and uh, help keep the, bird, the dinosaur warm. So feathers are really cool because they serve double duty both cooling and heating. So, an amazing adaptation. Whether you are trying to survive the Arctic or uh, the tropical rainforest. Um, so, they are unique to the dinosaurs. Uh, they are actually a modified scale. So, feathers are a modified scale if you look at the genes that control feather development, um, let's see, let's pop this button. Uh, what you'll see during feather development is the development of a scale, and then the scale will start to branch out. So the simplest feathers uh, are either just a single quill or spine um, with nothing attached to it or uh, this little simple branched out flexible thing that you think of as down. Those are the simplest feathers. Uh, and then you can find more complicated feathers as you go on until you get to those complicated flight feathers. So 
Uh, but it all starts with a feature that it closely resembles a scale. Um, avian dinosaurs also have scales. Just look at their legs. Right. So their legs are covered in a fine layer of scales. So, uh, pretty cool evidence that the dinosaurs evolved from reptiles and that feathers evolved from reptile scales. Uh, so, very cool stuff. Uh, feathers are replaceable. Um, they can be damaged and uh, dropped. You can drop damaged feathers. Birds will often pluck out their damaged feathers. And a lot of birds undergo a molt in which old feathers are dropped from the skin. And because you can just use vascular tissue to grow a new one, they regenerate or replace the damaged uh, or molted feathers. So, uh, extremely cool. Birds, the avian dinosaurs, are endotherms. They tend to run hotter than mammals. They have body temps higher than mammals. Um, this is because they require an extremely active metabolism to power flight, right? An extremely powerful active metabolism to be able to fly. Uh, so, pretty cool. They have a four-chambered heart. They have uh, extremely active metabolism to satisfy the ATP requirements for flight. And they have a really cool respiratory adaptation called air sac. I am going to draw a nice little conceptual map of air sacs. So we'll start with a beak. And here are the nostrils of an avian dinosaur, also called the nares. So we have our respiratory system extending outward. And then we have these small inflatable air sacs. And there are multiple air sacs running sort of underneath the skin along the body cavity of the bird. I'm not even going to try and draw this anatomically. This is a conceptual map. All right. The air sacs. The air sac system leads to the lungs. The air sacs can store air, amazingly enough. Uh, in biology, someone named it after what it does instead of after who described it, which is amazing. And then we connect out to our external breathing. So how we go is we breathe in through the nares, and then the air travels through the air sacs, and then to the lungs, and then out. And why is this amazing, you ask? Because air sacs store air, which means every time you breathe in, you fill an air sac, and that is fresh, oxygen-rich air, such that when all the air sacs are filled, uh, <clears throat> you breathe in, and you push air out of this air sac into the next, into the next, into the next, and out of the lungs, or into the lungs, right? And so you get fresh air into the lungs. Uh, that's how we do it, so without air sacs. So why is this amazing? Because when the air leaves the lungs, it pulls air out of an air sac and passes fresh air over the lungs. So... Avian dinosaurs get fresh air when they inhale and fresh air when they exhale. Um, this seems to be a feature of a diverse group of the dinosaurs related to avian dinosaurs. 
uh, sauropod dinosaurs, the old long-necked gigantic dinosaurs like Diplodocus and Brachiosaurus. They are more closely related to Tyrannosaurus than something like uh, an Iguanodon. Um, and we can find evidence uh, in impressions along their vertebra that they likely had air sacs, which helps explain how something so large could keep its oxygen requirements. So they get fresh air on the inhale and on the exhale. Us stupid humans, right, when we inhale, there's our fresh air, but then we exhale and, oh, there's nothing going on. You can exhale long enough to pass out because you're not getting any air. Stupid superior birds. Eh, what are you going to do? Dinosaurs are better than all of us. Okay. This is the phylogeny we have gone through. Right? Boom. We went through all our... We had our basal deuterostomes and echinoderms. Then we had corda chordata, starting with the cephalochordates and the urochordates, at which point we had the craniates, organisms with a well-defined head, right, and some skull features of those heads. Then we had the development of a vertebral column. And then we went on into the first vertebrates, the chondrichthian fish. Right? So there's our chondrichthes. We have a jaw now. We have a well-developed skeleton. It's mineralized, even if it's cartilage. Then we had our uh, bony fish, osteichthys, separated into the ray finned fish and the lobe-finned fish, amphibians, the first terrestrial vertebrates, and then lastly, reptilia and dinosauria. And that is what we've covered in this lecture. There's a few interesting questions that if you want some study guide-ish material for the exam, you can take a look at. Uh, fungi, arthropods, uh, diploblast, triploblast, uh, so stuff like that. Um, it's in the lecture that's available for download. So no point in staying here, which means I'm about to take a 10-minute break, uh, and I will email you when I, uh, so just after ending this, I'll email you with the link to the new live stream, and I'm going to take my 10 minutes to drink some coffee. So, farewell. Well, at least farewell once I press this button.